Father, we just thank you for all that you do, Lord God, and all that you've already done because you've done it all, Lord God. And we just want to give you all the glory and all the honor, Lord God, because it's all due unto you, Lord Heavenly Father. Let us never forget, Lord Heavenly Father, that it's all because of you, Lord God. And the more that we reside in you, the more that we trust in you, the more that we allow you to have your way in our life, and the more that we just hold on to you with all that we are, Lord God, the way that we're going to be able to see you for who you truly are in our lives. We thank you, Lord God, that you are a loving God, that you're a merciful God, that you're a gracious God, that you're a forgiving God, that you're patient and that you're kind. And we also thank you, Lord God, that you continue, Lord Heavenly Father, to work in and through our lives to change us and to conform us to your very image. I pray that this morning that you would move in might and power through this word and that you would speak to every single one of us this morning as we allow you to penetrate the depths of our hearts. Let us not have a heart of stone, but let us have that heart of flesh, Lord God, so that way you can work in us. Allow us to have teachable spirits, Lord God, and embrace those teachable moments in our lives, Lord. And we give you all the praise, all the honor and glory this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. Everybody may be seated this morning, amen. Uh, Brother John and his wife are, are moving this morning, amen. They, had, they just bought a, bought a house out in a different development. Uh, keep them in prayer this morning, amen. We know moving isn't an easy task. <laughs> it could bring out the worst in you. <laughs> Real quick, like, <laughs> oh, man. You know, uh, there's a few others, too. Um, Brother Jeremy, amen. Him and, uh, him and his wife have been transitioning, amen, from the church that they have been attending for, for a few years. And uh, this morning they're uh, teaching the Sunday school class over there. So keep them in prayer as well, amen, that the Lord would use them in a mighty way. Uh, there's a lot of others, you know what I mean, that uh, just go through the motions in life. And we need to, you know, pray for their encouragement uh, that they would just, you know, rely on the Lord and not, you know, rely on the flesh. You know, that's something that, that's key and that's important. Uh, sometimes when we come to God, we think that uh, we've been taught, you know, that life is just going to change and it's going to become so much easier and better. And, you know, it, that's not true. We learn, you know what I mean, from trusting in the Lord and from his peace and, you know, residing in his presence that we're able to go through life and be blessed. But the thing is, is that true Christians, when you go through a walk with the Lord, how I many you know that God wants, he takes you into the desert? He takes you into the desert, and we read about the promised land, but that's something that we inherit later on, you know, that's a... That's supposed to be prophetic, you know what I mean? And I know it was for the children of Israel as well as, as we read through Scripture, but they had to go through a journey, and it was many, many years, you know, that they were in captivity and the famines and the things that they went through. And then when they went to Egypt and, you know, just how they spent most of their life there and how the Lord had to take them through the wilderness. And as he was taking them through the wilderness, they uh, acquired, you know, what many difficult situations. You know, we never had to stand in front of the Red Sea. Imagine that being your only way of escape and having to stand in front of a, a body of water, you know what, and you got an army of Egyptians coming behind you ready to take your life, and you know what, and the only way out is to go through that, you know, through that water, and how the Lord made a way for them to go through it, but still, they weren't in the promised land. They went to the other side, and they were told about the promised land only to go back into the wilderness. I mean, know that those things produce character inside of our lives, church. Uh, we've been dealing a lot with uh, growing up, you know, during our, our midweek Bible studies and stuff like that. And then Friday night, I've been uh, dealing with, uh, with the flesh and um, the world and the devil, you know, and just how that incorporates into our, our prayer life and stuff like that. But how we changed it from prayer night to talking to Jesus night. Amen. 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 But you know that we need to learn how to talk to Jesus, amen? Because a lot of times it becomes too, you know what, religious and, and, and rituals, you know, and we're having prayer. No, you know what, because a lot of people, they don't even know what prayer is and they don't know how to pray. And what it is, is it's talking to Jesus. And I want you to go with me to the book of Colossians this morning, chapter 1, starting in verse 4. I'll be reading out the Amplified. 
Amen. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, how you lean on him with absolute confidence in his power, his wisdom, and goodness, and of unselfish love, which you have for all the saints, God's people. How many know that everything that we have, you know, we've been taught in the church, you know what I mean? Like, one thing I want to share with you this morning is that scripture, faith without works is dead. You know, and, and a lot of people, they confuse that, you know what I mean? They confuse it with, with, with worldly works, you know what I mean? The things that, that we do here, you know what I mean? The, the things that we do with our abilities and with our hands and stuff like that, that's not the works that it's talking about. You know, faith without works, you know, you got to have faith in what God did on the, on the cross of Calvary, what Jesus did. You know, that he paid that price on the cross of Calvary, and the faith that we have to have is absolutely in him. We can't have faith in nothing else. It has to be in Jesus Christ. It has to be in, in the penalty and the price that he paid for us, because without that, we have nothing. You know, it's like I shared with the, with the group on Friday. I said, you can have faith in that apple tree outside all you want to, that it's going to produce apples. But if you don't have the works, if you don't, you know what, nurture it, if you don't water it, if you don't give that tree what it needs to produce those apples, it won't produce apples. If you don't prune it, if you don't do all those things you got to do, it's not going to produce apples. It's going to die. It'll just be a branch, a stump. Same thing in our walk. Faith without works is dead. You know what? If you don't have your absolute faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and the works that he does, the fruit and the things that he produces, that's the works that I'm talking about. You know, being changed. Faith without works is dead. You can have faith in somebody all you want to, but if the works ain't there, if the evidence ain't there, it ain't real. You know, and that's just like our walk with the Lord. That's what the works is. The works is the evidence of him working through your life, of him changing you. That's the works. Faith without works is dead. I mean, there's a lot of people that believe in Jesus, but yet the works ain't there. The evidence of that fruit, the evidence of that, that growth or that change in their life just ain't there. They profess Jesus and they claim Jesus, but it ain't the Jesus that you and I know. Why? Because the Jesus that you and I know is a living God. The Jesus that you and I know is a faithful God. The Jesus that you and I know is a forgiving God. You know what? He's all in all. There's so many people that believe in a different Jesus. How many know that we hear from the Apostle Paul when he writes in Scripture, you know what, that they, they believed in, 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 a, in a different Jesus. They preached a different Jesus. You know, those different Jesuses that you hear about, you know, you hear a lot of them mainlined in, in, uh, in mega churches. Would I love to be a big church? I would love to be a big church. You know what, if God wills, that, that's his will. But you know what, I would never change the way that I preach. I would never change the way that I teach. Why? Because it has to be the word of God. It can't be something that, you know what, you want to you wanna make friends. And see, most mainstream churches, you know what, they want people to be friends. Let's be all friends. Let's all shake hands. Let's all pretend that we love each other, but let's not see that there's growth in our lives. So many people that go through those things, you know what, that's why they have so much different types of things to offer you in those type of churches. The only thing I have to offer you here is the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's the only thing I have to offer you. I ain't got nothing else to offer you. Me, I ain't nothing, so, you know, and I ain't much. I'm about this tall, so, you know, I, I really ain't got much to give, church, you know. So there's not much of me to offer, but I have the source, and the source is Jesus, you know what, and his word, and the Holy Spirit, and the anointing of God in our lives. You know, that's, that's all we need. You know what, we don't need no gimmicks. We don't need to put yoga in the church. We don't need to put Starbucks machines and Cheeto machines and pop machines and all these other machines, talking machines, whatever you want to do. We ain't got to bring all that stuff here for you guys to come. Why? Because you guys are desire, desiring something real in your life. You know what? You guys have had all the gimmicks, you know what, offered to you out there. And now you're coming for something real. Why? Because the Jesus that we serve, is, is he's real. He's a living God. Amen. But I like what it says here. He says, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, the leaning on your entire human 
personality on him, an absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, and the love which you have and show for all the saints, God's consecrated ones. You know that we have to rely totally on him? How many sometimes we only rely on him on Sundays? I've had a bad week. I need to go to church. You know what? This ain't Dr. Feelgood. You know what? This isn't a place where you come, you know what, to get your quick fix and then go back out into the world just to be busted and disgusted and never to be trusted. You know, this is a place where you come, you know why? Because you need more of Jesus. But you know what? You can't just get the Jesus on Sunday. You got to get him throughout the whole week. You got to spend time with Jesus. You know, you got to talk to Jesus. You know, those Friday nights, talking to Jesus nights. That's not just on Friday. That's something that has to happen to us throughout our whole, our whole life. Seven days a week, 365 days a year, we got to learn how to talk to Jesus. we got to learn how to go to him, you know what, with absolute trust, with confidence in, what, in his power. How many you know that we're powerless if it isn't for him? We're powerless. You know what, it's not by might nor by power, but by the strength of the Lord is what the, what the word of God says. It's by his strength, his power. We're nothing. I don't care how much weight you lift. I don't care what you bench press on the bench. Y'all didn't know me when I was in prison. I would outdo all, every single one of you guys in here, I guarantee you. I used to rep 415. Break it myself and rep it five times, rock it, and do sets of five. The little bulldog on the yard. That's when I told you I couldn't move around either, too. I was over here. I got out of prison. I was like this. I needed my wife to do everything for me. Honey, help. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter how strong you are on the outside. It matters what's on the inside. How many know that God loves you? How many know that we got to go through things? And that's the reason why our confidence and our trust and everything has to be in the Lord. Why? Because when we serve God, we're going to go through things. How many of you know that once you gave your life to the Lord that the enemy's coming to attack you? The word of God says that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. You know what? He wants to begin to kill, steal, and destroy everything in your life. Why? Because you're beginning to learn who you are in Christ Jesus. When we were out there in the world and we didn't know the Lord, guess what? We didn't know who we were. And now we're beginning to find out who we really are. But when we begin to find out who we really are, we really know we need to know who we trust in and who we rely in church. And it has to be all in him. You can't rely on your employer. You can't rely on the counselor. You can't rely on your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your husband or your wife. Would you love to? Yes, you would. But you have to learn how to rely on the source. How many of you know that our marriages are not going to be complete unless God is the center of our marriage? How many of you know that our relationships with friends and family members and and our our co-workers and everything that we go through in life is never going to be centered or even blessed if he isn't the center of it all? Because you'll begin to conform to a pattern of this world. How many of you know that it's easy to go out there, especially construction workers? I don't get construction workers or oil field workers. It seems like, you know what, they come to church and they're all holy, but as soon as they go back into their job, man, right away they're talking like the rest of them, joking around like they do, and, you know, and even they don't even have to accept their jokes, but they sit there and they listen to them. They're talking all this nastiness, and you're right there in the middle. <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have laughed at that one. <laughs> Instead of telling them, you know what, stop it. You know, you don't have to talk like that. How far did you go in school? I didn't go very far. Got my JED, my GED. But you know what? You don't have to worry about that stuff. When the Lord is growing you and building you, you got to understand that you got to begin to, you know what, allow him to build you, strengthen you, and change you in such a way that when people see you and when you're around them and the way that you talk and the way that you handle yourself, when they come around you, they're going to second guess. They're going to be, oh, I shouldn't talk like that around brother. I shouldn't talk like that around sister. They're going to begin to feel, you know what, this guilt and condemnation inside of themselves. 
Not because of them, because they're living the way that they're living. But if you're a man or woman of integrity and you rely and you trust in the Lord, then guess what? People begin to see Jesus. And when people see Jesus, people change. You know why people don't change is because they see us. That's why they don't change. You know how people changed when they seen the Apostle Paul? Man, before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul. And Saul was one of those ones like you and I were. You know what? We, we demanded respect. You're going to respect me or else. <laughs> And said, so, you know what, that was Saul. And then the Lord changed him and he became the Apostle Paul. And he began to rely and trust in Jesus and everything that he was and everything that he did. And no matter what situation he was in in life and what he was facing, wherever God took him and wherever he was at in life, people began to change. Roman soldiers gave their life to Jesus because they seen how he handled himself, the way that he lived. No matter if he was in the midst of a whole bunch of rats and, and cockroaches and bugs and, and feces sitting in these, these Roman soldier prisons, he was happy. Whether they fed him or not, you know what? He wasn't grumpy and complaining. Yo, what's up, man? I want my food. I want my lunch. No. Why? Because the Apostle Paul trusted in God and God alone. In verse 8, if we go down to there in Colossians chapter 1, verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. It says, also, he has informed us of your love in the Holy Spirit. How many of you guys love the Holy Spirit? How many of you guys have had an encounter with the Holy Spirit? How many of you guys are born again, Amen. speaking in tongues, baptized? You don't even have to speak in tongues. You know what? Because that's, that's false doctrine. Okay? Should we desire to speak in tongues? Yes, we should. But the Apostle Paul specifically states in the Gospels, do all speak in tongues? And there's a question mark there because the answer is no. But should we all desire to speak in tongues? Yes, we should. But there's a way to speak in tongues and a way not to speak in tongues. How many know that there's demonic spirits that, you know what, run and infiltrate through the church and they want all the attention? So instead of, you know what, when you go in and you see people, they're all speaking loudly in tongues and right away you begin to get freaked out. Oh man, this place is full of demonicos. <laughs> Why? Because they want to be the loudest voice inside of the church. You know, when the Bible tells us that when we pray in tongues, that we should pray in tongues in our closets or in our secret place. Is there a problem with praying in tongues in the church? No. You know what the problem in praying in tongues when it comes to church is when your speaking in tongues is overruling and overpowering everybody else in the church. I mean, that you speaking in tongues is for you and God. And then when there is a loud speaking in tongues, that, that will always follow with an interpretation. Why? Because God wants to get your attention in the church. And usually when that begins to take place, there begins to become a silence in the church. Why? Because you begin to hear that person speaking in tongues. That same person can interpret the tongues. Can there be a different individual that interprets it? Yes, there can be. And how much should there be? No more than three. Because anything above that is disorder and discord. We have to understand these things, church. Do you love the Holy Spirit? Yes. Say it again. Yes. Amen. I mean, that the Holy Spirit's our best friend. He's our best friend. You know what? The Holy Spirit is the one who is with you 24-7, 365 days a year. He's with you all the time. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's right there. He's your comforter. He's your counselor. He's your hope. He's your friend. He's there for you to talk to. He's there to help you out. The Holy Spirit. Do you love the Holy Spirit, church? Amen. Amen. I love the Holy Spirit. And I love to see the Holy Spirit work in people's lives. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing when you begin to see the Holy Spirit work in people's lives because that's when you know that they're relying and they're trusting in God. 
That's when you know that they're giving God their all. It's not about them. It's all about God because the Holy Spirit is able to do what he needs to do in and through our lives. And what's that? Get us closer to Jesus. A lot of times we, we get it confused. We, we, we get filled with the Spirit, and I don't know if it's, it's not the Spirit of God. For most people, for us it is here, you know, at New Hope Ministries of Brighton. There's a lot of other churches out there that profess to be filled with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, but yet they want to operate and work by the flesh. You know what? Faith without works is dead. You can have children's ministry. You can have youth ministry. You can have marriage ministries. You can have prison ministries. You can have all kinds of different ministries that operate according to the flesh. But if they're not Holy Ghost filled, if they're not round by the Holy Spirit, it's just round by a demonic spirit and the flesh. So many people, they always want to say, oh, well, I don't know what to say. Praise God. Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, you know what, you ain't going to know what to say. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is going to give you those words to say when it's time. I never know what I'm going to say when I come up here. I don't, you know, I read the word and I, and I pray and I trust in the Lord all week. But I'm not one of those pastors who prepare sermons a week in advance. Never have been, never will be. I'm not one of those series, you know, doing sermon kind of guy. We're going to do a series in here. This week we're going to learn about this, and next week we're going to touch on that and learn about that. No, because that's the flesh. That's not the Holy Spirit. Verse 9 says, For this reason we also, from the day we heard of it, have not ceased to pray and make special requests for you, asking that you may be filled with the full, deep, and clear knowledge of his will, will in all spiritual wisdom and comprehensive insight into the ways and the purposes of God and the understanding and the discernment of spiritual things. How I many know that's supposed to be Jesus all day, every day? And when it comes from, you know what, the word of God being preached from behind the pulpit, it has to be about Jesus. It has to be about him and his will and his plan and his purpose. Man, I, I can't just be one of those preachers that just comes up here and just wants to tell you guys everything that you guys want to hear. They call those, you know what, it's like that, that old song, candy-coated raindrops. <laughs> call them candy-coated sermons. Why? Because they're just sweet and they tickle your ears. That's all they do. You know what, they make you feel good for a, for a minute. But how many of you know you're going to have that rush and then all of a sudden you're going to crash? That's with so many Christians, you know well, why? Because they're being taught some things from behind. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be, just, just trust in the Lord. Just, well, how do I trust in the Lord? You know what, you're telling me trust in the Lord, but I need to know how to trust in the Lord. You know what, you're telling me to love the Lord, but how do I love the Lord? You're telling me how to rely on the Lord, but how do I re rely on the Lord? See, it's the how, it's the in-between, it's those things that are lacking in the church. And the reason why is because they don't want to lose people. I don't know about you, if you've been looking around everything in the economy and everything that's going on, you know what, churches ain't doing so good right now. That's why they're going to YouTube. They don't even have a service, a building where they meet in. They just have YouTube service. I don't get it. And he's called us to be a body and to operate as a body church. But in understanding and discernment of spiritual things. How many of you know the only way to understand and discern spiritual things is to talk to Jesus? We call that prayer. Okay, talking to Jesus. The only way to begin and to understand spiritual things is to have a prayer life. You know what? You have to have a prayer life. Without a prayer life, you will have nothing. You can read this word all you want to, but guess what? You'll never apply this word to your life. Why? Because you'll never be drawn into the presence of God to where you truly reside in Him and trust in Him with everything that you are, or you begin to have to, you know what, trust in this word for your life. How many of us, if something goes wrong, we call somebody else instead of going straight to Jesus? Man, I can't pay my rent this month. I'm going to call the loan place up the thing. <laughs> and they get you. You know what? They reel you in there. You know what? Instead of, you know what? Going to God. 
and trusting in God, you know what, and somebody calls you on the phone and says, you know what, I was praying this morning, sister, I was praying this morning, brother, and God told me to bless you with this. That's answered prayer. But a lot of times we take it on our own and we'll go over there to, you know what, to the place, the loan me money place. And we'll say, oh, this has got to be from the Lord. They even gave me an extra $100. <laughs> You're going to pay for that extra $100, man, <laughs> big time. Your 30-day loan turned into a 160-day loan because you took the extra 100 on top. They get you on that interest. Verse 10 says, that you may walk and live and conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him and desiring to please him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God with fuller, deeper knowledge of God or a clearer insight, an acquaintance and a recognition Growing deeper. How many of you guys, you just know a whole bunch of surface level Christians? They're the ones that, you know what, they, they really don't know how to swim. How many of you guys know how to swim in here? How many of you guys don't know how to swim? It's okay, it's okay. That's, that's a worldly thing, you know, but it's a, it's a good concept. You know, because that's what I like to, you know, put as surface level Christians. They never get past their fears. Why? Because they just stay right on the top. They're so fearful of getting under the water or getting wet, you know what I mean? Because they, they can't breathe. They feel suffocated. Things ain't going the way that they like them to do. They're not in control. See, when you're on the top and you got your little floaties on, you're in control. <laughs> but when you ain't got your floaties on and you got to go under, guess who's in control? God is in control. And how does it usually happen when you see somebody that don't know how to swim and they get out there or they're just learning to swim? Man, they're splashing and kicking and water's going all over. They're like one of them bobbers that somebody goes fishing. You know what, that little thing that goes, it's supposed to stay on the top of the water and it goes under and lets you know that you got a fish on the line. That's a Christian in the spiritual realm. He got that bobber on. <laughs> He's just bobbing up and down. <laughs> I think I got a fish. I think I got a fish. No, that's just a wave. You ain't got no fish. <laughs> Man, it is over there taking your bait. But the real things are underwater, church. But I like what it says, all things bearing fruit in every good work and steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of God with fuller, deeper, and a clearer insight, an acquaintance, and a recognition. How do you get to recognize Jesus? By talking to Jesus. How are you going to know somebody if you don't talk to him? How are you going to know somebody if you don't spend time with him? Man, you really don't know Jesus if you only spend time with him on Sundays. You know what? In order to know Jesus, you've got to spend time with him every single day. How do you know your spouse? How do you know your friends? How do you know your family? Because you spent your life with them. You know what? You know that, that Theo likes to throw down some cold ones. Why? Because he's been throwing down cold ones all his life. You know that's what Theo does. He's a drinker. Do you love him? Yeah, you love him. Do you hang out with him? Not no more. And why don't you hang out with Theo anymore? It's because you're beginning to learn about who you are. How I many know a lot of us, our identities reside in somebody else? We've never thought about that, huh? The way that we've grown up and our identity is in everybody that we've hung out with or grew up with. That's where our identity resides in. That's who we are because that's who we thought we were. You know, I remember I wanted to be the biggest gangbanger and drug dealer that was out there. So what did I do? I hung out with gangbangers and drug dealers all my life. Not fake ones, real ones. Half of the guys I hung out with are dead. Probably 90% of them are dead. 
they've died already. They got shot, and you know what I mean, and they lost their life, not, not from drug overdoses or anything like that. The rest, you know, the rest of the couple are in prison for life. And those are the people that I used to look up to in my life. And that's who I thought my identity was in. Why? Because I wanted to be like them. I wanted to act like them. I wanted to talk like them. And until, you know what, I got a hold of Jesus and he began to separate me and I began to learn what my true identity was and I began to say, oh man, that's the way I was talking? That's the way I was acting? Oh, that's horrible. I could just imagine what everybody else thought. Who's your identity from, church? You know, you're waiting for somebody to give you a pat on the back. Oh, good job. You know, that's something that I always used to have to, that I, it was my, one of my biggest problems that I had in my life. When it was through work or whatever, I would work so hard, you know what, and, and do the best that I could do, you know what, but I was always waiting for my employer or somebody to give me a pat on the back and say, oh, man, you're doing such a great job. You're doing such an awesome job. Because that's where my identity was. My identity was in somebody, you know what, telling me you're doing a good job, you're doing a good job. And that's what had me going to, to, to strive to do better in life. Not anymore. Why? Because I fell in love with Jesus. Amen. And when I go to work, guess what? I don't go to work for my employer anymore. I go to work because I want to be a good steward. I go to work. Why? Because Jesus has me there where I'm at to be able to witness to people, to be a, a light. You know what? Where there is no light, to be an example, to be a good steward. And I don't need nobody to give me a pat on the back and tell me I'm doing a good job. Why? Because my heavenly father does it all day long. All day long. Why? Because I feel his love. I feel his presence all around me all day long. I just don't need it every once in a while. I get it all the time. How many of you guys, you know what, just want to feel good about yourselves every once in a while when somebody tells you you're doing good? I want to feel good about myself all the time. Every single day, no matter what, I want to feel good about myself. And it's not from somebody else telling me. It's because the Lord's telling me. Because I have a personal relationship with him. And why is that? Because I'm bearing fruit in every good work. Bearing fruit in every good work. How many know sometimes it takes time for those fruits to, to come out? I've been learning a lot about apple trees lately because I have apple trees in my backyard when I first moved there and they weren't so pleasing. <laughs> and the sad thing is, is they let that tree grow way too big without pruning it. So I got to get rid of them. Why? Because they're just too high and they didn't prune them wide. The branches ain't down low enough for me to be able to even get fruits off of them. It, it's done. It's a waste. Why? Because it was able to, to grow on its own and do its own thing for so long without direction that, you know what, it's just out there on its own now. So I got to chop it down and start from square run. But the thing with those, you know, they're small fruits. When a thing is too big has too much foliage on it, too much leaves, too much branches, all the other branches suffocated out, and it's only able to get these little, small, little fruits on there. How many of that's a lot of us? So much flesh that the Lord wants to produce fruits in our life, but you know what? We got these little old fruits, and we're all happy. Because there's a little old apple right there. It's a little old apple. Imagine that big old apple like that, man. Imagine those, those fruits, you know what I mean, when he, when he sent the spies in to go, you know what, look at that land, and they came back with these, with these clusters of grapes that were like the size of giants. Imagine a grape like that big, as big as me. It's a big grape. That's a fruit, man. That's, that's, a, that's a ripe, luscious fruit. You know where that comes through? That comes through, you know what, having a relationship with God, spending time with Him. You know what, having a fuller and deeper and clearer insight and acquaintance and a recognition. How many of you guys give the Lord recognition for everything in your lives? Man, I was talking about, I was talking on Friday night about being thankful and how, you know, a little bit how being thankful, just being thankful will do a lot of things in your life. 
you know, this guy, he came and he started sharing, you know what, these, these, these uh, messages with his family because they all caught COVID uh, after a wedding. And uh, one of his family members didn't have nothing to be thankful about. And he was saying, he goes, I don't got nothing to be thankful about. He goes, you got to have something to be thankful about. He was sick in bed, couldn't move and do nothing. He couldn't even get out of bed. That's how sick he was. And all he could see was a door and a window in his room. So he started thanking God for that door and that window in his room. And within hours, he began to receive his energy back. He began to get up and walk around and, and start to be thankful for a whole bunch of other things in his life that he just didn't see before. You know, and that comes from having a relationship with the Lord. You know what? When you spend time with Jesus, when you talk to him, you know what? He's going to begin to allow you to see things that you've never seen before, things that you're going to be more thankful for. How many of you are thankful for your families? Amen. Whether they're lost or not, amen? Praise God. I'm thankful for my family members, whether they're lost or not. How many of you know that God can use anything? How many of you guys remember when you were lost? God used you, didn't he? Amen. Amen. Why do we forget how good God is? We forget that God can use anything and everything, however he wants, whenever he wants, because he's God. Yeah. And our job is to start being thankful. How many of you guys start thanking your family members that ain't doing so well? You know what? They're addicted to certain types of things, you know what? And their life is in shambles. But thanking for the good qualities and traits that they have in life that they forgot that they had. And start being thankful for those things so that way they can start seeing them in their life. Amen. See, we forget about all that, church. We forget about that. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Verse 11 says, we pray that you may be invigorated and strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory to exercise every kind of endurance and patience, perseverance, forbearance with joy. How many of you guys like to exercise? Not everybody has some people. I used to love to exercise. I told you, I used to get up early in the morning. I'd get up and I'd hit the gym before I went to work, go to work, do all my protein shakes. I had, well, I had to make sure I was working at a place that had a gym so I could hit the gym at lunch. Take my protein shakes and everything again and then go home and hit the gym again before dinner. I was one of those three times a day type of workout people. I loved working out. Not so much anymore. <laughs> but with endurance, I like what it says there. It says, we pray that you may be invigorated and strengthened with all power according to might of his glory to exercise every kind of endurance and patience and perseverance and forbearance with joy. How many of you guys have joy when you're going through things? <coughs> Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to have joy when everything else around you is falling apart. But how do we have that joy when everything else around us is falling apart? The only way to have that joy is if we begin to exercise our faith, exercise our relationship with the Lord, talking to him. You know what? That's an exercise, a spiritual exercise. Now, how many know that our spiritual man is weak? The word of God tells us. The word of God tells us plainly about these things and the apostle paul addressed them a lot of times i want you to go with me to matthew chapter 11 verse 28 come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Heavy laden means to be weighted down with or a heavy burden, oppressed with family cares, carrying a large amount of something. How many know a lot of us, we carry around stuff that we shouldn't be carrying around? And who does the Lord tell us to go to? He says, come to me, right? So how many of us were carrying the weight of our family? 
That's a sin. You're not supposed to be carrying the weight of your family. You're supposed to be bringing it to Jesus. It's not your weight to carry. It's not your burden to carry. It's not yours to carry. you got to take it to the Lord. He says, come to me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened, and I will cause you to rest. The only reason why is because we go to the wrong thing, church. We carry all these burdens and we share them. You know what I call them? Chismosos and chismosas. Gossipers. That's what they are. They go gossip. Instead of going to the Lord, they go to their other family members. Oh, do you know what, what sister's doing? Oh, I can't handle this no more. I don't know. You need to go talk to her. I don't need to go do nothing. You need to mind your own business. You know, that's your problem. Well, you don't know how to mind your own business. How many of us as Christians don't know how to mind our own business? Come on now. You got saved, and all of a sudden, everybody's business became your business. We know those ones in the church. We call them busybodies. That's what the Bible calls them, busybodies. They go, that, that's, their, that's their whole purpose and their whole plan. They don't even come to church to hear the word or to be filled with the Holy Spirit. They come to church to hear all the chisme, all the gossip and everything, and then they go out and they share it with everybody else. Shame on them. You need to pray for them. You need to pray for them, little busy boy. You know what, Tom? You know what I got right here? I got a pocket full of zippers. You know, put this on your mouth and zip it up real quick. You're talking too much, Tom. <laughs> How is it they always talk about everybody else and they don't talk about themselves? That's true, right? They're always talking about everybody else and they don't talk about themselves. We had a sister that used to come to this church. God bless her. I love her. She's an older lady. A lot of you guys probably know her. I'm not going to say her name. She's not coming here anymore. But she's a chismosa. That's what she is. She goes from church to church to church. She goes to the Buddhist church. She goes to the Jehovah's Witness church. She goes to the Catholic church. She goes to every church in Brighton. She ain't really a part of a church, and she tries to pull people from different churches to go to other churches. What she need to do is learn to go to Jesus. She used to call me all the time. I wouldn't even answer her phone calls after a while. I said, I ain't even going to answer her phone call anymore. Just, how do you know you have that, that scam shield on your phone? And right away, her number was on scam shield right away. She's a scam. Man, right away, she's trying to scam right away, man. She's trying to get some people in trouble. That's, that's all she's trying to start some stuff, man. That's it. Boop, lock, reject it. <laughs> I mean, you know, you guys got to do that with some people in your life, man. You got to get that scam shield, that Christian scam shield. Block, reject it. I ain't even answering that phone call. Nope, ain't even going to do it. Ain't even going there. Ain't going to happen. But I pray for her. Why? Because I truly do love her. I do. I love her. You know what? She has some very good traits and qualities to her life, but she has a lot of bad ones. But you know what? I don't want her to be like that. But God's got to change her. And the only way for God to change her is I got to pray for her. I got to pray for her. I got to say, you know what, Lord? You touch her, Lord God. You know what? I got to bring that burden to him. I got to bring all my cares to him. I can't go sharing them with everybody else. I got to go take them to the Lord. Lord, you need to work a miracle, Lord God. You need to do this. You need to do that, Lord God. We can't do nothing. You're the one that needs to do it. And we got to trust you to do it. How many of you guys are carrying a large amount of something? Man, the Lord broke me, church. He, literally, he broke me. <laughs> and I can't do what I used to do. I, I just, I can't do it. I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. You know what I mean? Just think, I just can't do it anymore. And now I won't do it. I go to work now. You know, I went back to work. I go to work now, and I just tell everybody, my job is to sit on the tailgate. That's it. My job is to point you in the right direction, and if you mess it up, you mess it up, and go back and do it again. Now, we ain't going back and doing it again. You're going to learn from your mistakes, but the thing is, is that's it. I'm not going to do it for you. And I just got to sit back, and I got to trust in God to do what he needs to do. You know, that's the hardest thing is just letting go sometimes. How many of you guys, your guys, your hands have to be on everything? That's a, that's a typical guy. 
Typical guys, our hands have to be on everything. Man, your wife can't even be cooking in the kitchen. You got to go, I don't, I don't put that. You got to put it like that. Yeah. <laughs> I do it like this. I don't care how you do it. Just go sit over there and shut up. I'm going to make dinner for you. You're going to eat something. That's why she don't cook anymore. <laughs> see? See what happened? Man, see what happened? Man, I had a good thing going. I had to put my hands all over it, man. Man, I messed that all up, didn't I? See, that's what happens a lot of times in life. We got some good things going, and we're going to put our hands all over it, church. We got to just let go and let God. I mean, like God got some very good things going, and we just got to take a step back and let God be God. How many of you guys are afraid of your children going to, well, not, you know, it, it depends on what background you're from. I think for my family, the biggest thing was, oh, I'm afraid of my kids going to jail. <laughs> so we would do everything. We're over there to bail them out and everything, and not really the husband. The husband. Deja alone. Leave him alone. Let him learn. Let him grow up. No, but he's my son. <laughs> She's my daughter. I got, I got it. I got No, you don't. Let him learn. We don't ever want to let them learn, and we go and we bail. We, we put our hands on everything. My mom was the best at that. Híjole. I don't know why she always thought I was over there at the river. Oh, deed. I was over there at somebody's house partying. I wasn't at the river. <laughs> I knew better to be at the river. I was somewhere else. I was partying. But she would always be out there looking for me. She wanted to have her hands on everything. And with her hands being on everything, it destroyed her marriage. Not only did it destroy her marriage, man, it destroyed the relationship that me and my sister had. Why? Because, man, she, was, she hated me. She said, man, that's all you care about is Leon. How many of you, every time when our hands on it, it seems like that's all we care about? We don't have time for nothing else? But if you would learn to let go and love Jesus and allow him to change you, you would begin to have so much more time. You'd be so much more loving. And people would see that you're so much caring and that you really do have compassion for them. But you got to learn to let go, church. Even in ministry. Man, I don't know why the Lord used my wife all the time. I, man, I got hurt in ministry. How many of you have been hurt in ministry? Come on, that's everybody in here. Raise your hand. Hallelujah. I'm not the only one in here. Everybody's been hurt in ministry. I got hurt by the pastor. I got hurt by sister. I got hurt in Sunday school. I got hurt in youth. I got hurt. Oh, I got hurt. I got hurt. Ah, oh, suck it up. Man, everybody got hurt. You know, that's the flesh right there. But we've all been hurt. You know, and I got hurt and I didn't want nothing to do with the ministry at all. I wanted to be, I just wanted to keep the pew warm. That's it. You know, the pew warmer, bench warmer, you know what I'm talking about? Bench warmer, they, they just sit on the sidelines. Everybody else plays the game. Everybody else is in the game, but you just sit there and watch. You don't even break a sweat. Man, I don't even know why they go to the locker room. I don't even know why they dress up for the sport, man. They ought to just stay out there in their regular clothes. They ain't getting put in. That's so many Christians. That was me when I got hurt in the church. I just wanted to be a pew warmer. I didn't want to do anything. I carried a burden for so long. It was so heavy that I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to do nothing. I just wanted to come to church on Sunday, forget Wednesdays, forget Mondays, forget Fridays, forget outreaches, forget this, forget that, just Sunday. If I felt like it. <laughs> if I felt like it. It was a burden that I carried for so long. And I remember the Holy Spirit used my wife. And I, oh, man. <laughs> Me and her are like two rams. You know, they say iron sharpens iron. Man, we're like those two rams that you see on the, the Discovery Channel, you know. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> yeah, most of the time, it's my wife. And we go back and forth and back and forth. And the Holy Spirit always tell her, tell him to submit. Tell him to submit. If you don't submit, I'm not going to move. I'm not going to move. And finally, you know what? I'd just be so messed up. I'd be like, all right then, fine. I'm going to submit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh, 
Amen. And then the Lord began to do things in my life. But I had to submit. You know, and it's just like us in the church. You know what? Iron sharpens iron, brothers and sisters. We're like rams. Button heads all the time. You know, that's, that's the famous. I didn't agree with what pastor said today. I didn't like it. I didn't like it one bit. That's why I don't go on Wednesdays and Fridays. Because he tells me to go on Wednesdays and Fridays, and I don't agree with him. Submit. <laughs> Stop carrying a burden and let go and let God do what he needs to do in your life. How many know he wants us to bear fruit, church? Amen. 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 Give him praise this morning. <laughs> and the only way for us to begin to bear the fruit that he needs us to bear is to let go. We got to stop carrying everybody else's burdens. Why? Because they're heavy. How many know sometimes we carry emotional burdens? Our emotional burdens, man, we're carrying it around, and we just don't know how to let it go. I know how to let it go. How do you let it go? Talking to Jesus. Start talking to Jesus. That's what you got to do, amen. You got you to gotta love that song. He's like, I love that song. You know, that's a song that has to be in your life. A love of talking to Jesus. You know what? I just want to talk to Jesus. You know what? When I'm feeling the way that I do, I want to talk to Jesus. How I many you know when you start talking to Jesus and his love fills you and discovers you, that burden just begins to go away. It just lifts off of you. You don't feel it anymore, man. Yes. That's where it comes from. You know what? Coming to him instead of letting it ponder and ponder and ponder and ponder. Why? Because it gets heavier and heavier and heavier. I can't do that. I'll be walking around like this. I'm already getting old already. Like Brother Ricky says, looking at defeat, feeling defeated. <laughs> We've got to learn to build up our posture and stand up, church. But that all comes through talking to Jesus. You know, we've got to go to the source, and we've got to trust in him, and we've got to know who we are in Christ Jesus. I want you to go with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 16. Verses 1 through 3. A little bit of Bible surfing this morning, amen? Go from here to there to everywhere. Chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. And we've been studying on this on, Wednesday, uh, on Friday nights. This is some of the stuff that I've been touching on, but I like this. It says, they set out from Elam. And all the congregation of Israel came to the wilderness of sin. Eee. How many you know that we got to face our sin? God's going to take you right there so that way you can begin to face your sinful nature. How many know that's why the wilderness is so important? He's got to take you right there so you can begin facing the facts of life that we're sinful. We're so full of sin that we're in need of a Savior that we need to know Him. We need to love Him. We need to trust in Him. We need to conform to His will. You know what? In His pattern and everything that He did. And He says, they set out from Elam and all the congregation of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. You I mean, know, there's always an in-between point. And we like to be on one side or the other. We don't like to be right there where we need to be. Facing the facts the, that show the facts of life. And on the 15th day of the second month after they left, let's go on, the land of Egypt. Ah, it's like 30 days, church. I mean, no, they were out there, they were, they were oppressed. I mean, some of us were oppressed. And we said, man, I need something different. And then we come to church. And then you hear a pastor like me, and you're like, oh, man, I feel more oppressed. <laughs> I should have went to the church up the street. <laughs> the positive, encouraging K-Love church up the street. <laughs> when they make me feel good about myself. But only for a brief moment. 
I'm telling you, you can go to any church here in Brighton. I grew up here. You can go to any church here in Brighton, and they're going to make you feel good about yourself. They're going to want you to feel good about yourself. Why? Because they don't care about you. They care about what you put in the basket. That's all they care about. We care about you here. And we care about where you're going to go and how you're going to grow and how you're going to be able to handle things in life. But we got to face the facts of reality. Let's go on. He says, and the whole congregation of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. I mean, that's what happens. Now, we have that transition period in our lives. We go from the worst of the worst, and we go, oh, I'm a Christian now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm born again, man. Everybody loves me. No, they don't. And now it's time to face the facts of reality, and you get hit right in the face, and you're right there. Oh, my life. Oh, my kids. Oh, my grandkids. Oh, uh, 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 uh. murmuring. My husband. Oh, my wife. <laughs> Come on now. Maybe it's your animals. Maybe you guys got animals. Oh, my gato. Your cat. <laughs> He still love her, amen? But we murmur, and we complain. You know, we, we get involved, you know what? And we say, oh, I'm going to get involved in ministry, and then all of a sudden we start getting involved, and what's the first thing that we do? Murmur. Complain. Complain. Now we start saying, oh, I, I'm, this isn't my calling. Pastor forced me to be a teacher. <laughs> I just had you by your pinky and I was twisting it. You're gonna, you're gonna do it. You're gonna do it. No, I didn't. Come on now. I never did that to nobody here. Come on. He said, I want to. And I said, okay, praise God. Let's do it. And then all of a sudden, I don't want to do this no more. It's too hard. Oh, I don't get it. Everybody's telling me no. And I'm not gonna, and what am I gonna do? And this and that. Pocket full of zippers. Sh shut up. Why? Because I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm doing this for God. I'm not doing it for anybody else. But see, what happens is when we get faced with reality and we get faced with sin and we get faced, you know what, with ourselves and the flesh and we got to rely on who? Instead of this, what do we do? We complain and we murmur. That's how you know Christians are operating in the flesh and not by the Spirit. Why? Because they complain and they murmur about everything that they do. I don't have enough help. Neither do I. I don't see you volunteering and raising your hand. I'm going to preach this Sunday, Pastor. Give me a shot. No, you're the pew warmer. You don't want to get up here and preach. I wonder what everybody's going to think about me. Who cares what they think about you? You only care about what God thinks about you and do it for the Lord. Amen? Amen. But they always blamed Moses and Aaron. How come they couldn't blame nobody else? How come they couldn't blame themselves? How come they blame somebody else all the time? How come when things ain't going right, we always like to blame everything else? Oh, it's the contractors. Now, that's why the, law, the walls ain't plumb. You know, the walls ain't never going to be plumb. I'm just honest with you. I don't know about you. And some people that have been in the construction field, you can go to any If you didn't do it yourself, them walls are going to be crooked. Why? Because they're just going and they're slapping something together real quick to get in and get out and go to the next one. They don't care how straight they are. You can fix it on the next round. You can fix it on the next round. You know what? Brother Jose knows about that. When it comes down to the last part and the things he's doing. You know, that's a drag when you're always having to try to shim and do all these other things and fix things because the other person didn't take pride in what he was supposed to be doing. He complained and murmured, I ain't got enough time. <laughs> you got all the time in the world, church. I don't know about you, but Jesus is coming soon, and you better reevaluate your time and your situations. Why? Because there's not much time left to win people over to Christ. 
There's not much time left for allow him to produce the fruits that he needs to produce in our lives. We got to stop complaining and stop blaming everybody else for why the things are going the way that they're going. Man, I'm glad I was saved when I got out of prison. Because I remember looking at everybody else, all the people that I went to school with, the people that I used to hang out with. On, man, they got a nice house, man. They, man, they got a car, man. They got a nice job, man. They got all these things. I'm over here, and I got, I got you know, the stuff from, from, the, from the Segunda. I'm wearing somebody else's clothes. I'm wearing that. There's nothing wrong with that. Why? Because they're my clothes. Amen. Amen. But the thing is, is I was saved and I got out. And I said, man, I started looking at that and the Lord convicted me right away. He said, don't worry about what everybody else has. Yeah. Yeah. Things take time. Yeah. And I remember he would always put people in my path. Take it easy, man. Don't worry about it. Things take time. You're doing good. Things take time. Things take time. And little by little, little by little, little by little, you know what? The Lord began doing things, and it was difficult, and it was hard, and they took time, but I appreciated them more. Why? Because God did it. I didn't do it. God did it. And what God does, no man can ever take away from you. Amen. You can't take away my joy. Why? Because God gave it to me. You can try all you want to, but you can't take it from me, and I ain't giving it to you. Why? Because God gave it to me. That's something I won't give up, church. That's something I hold on to. Let's go on to verse 3. It says, And he said to them, With that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate bread to the full for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger you got me doing too much pastor oh man it's so hard and you only teach on Sundays what's so hard about that Oh, man, pastor you want us at prayer every Friday it's too hard no, it's not. It's hard for you. It's not hard for me. It used to be hard for me. And I get it. Some of us work. Some of us have things. But what about all the other times that you don't? I'm tired. <laughs> Come on now. That was my number one excuse. I worked all day. <laughs> Ah, amen. You're going to continue to work. Amen. It's not going to change. You're going to have to work for the rest of your life. Especially the way things are going now. There ain't going to be no retirement. They, it's all ate up. They all took it in. And, and they took everybody's Social Security and everything. They did. That's why they're making it so hard for people to get their Social Security nowadays. Why? Because the Social Security money ain't there anymore. They gave it away in all this COVID relief and everything. Eee, you didn't think about that, huh? Oh, it's free money. Nothing's free. <laughs> it all comes with the price, church. But they were so happy. They were in Egypt. They were in bondage. But they were there by the flesh pots. You know, that's where they were boiling the, fu the food. Some of us call it, you know, the carne asada. We're going out there, oh, we're going to go have some chicharrones or whatever. So they're boiling in the pot, shh, some caldo de res, some beef soup. Huh? They were able to eat all they wanted all the time, just sitting there eating and eating. They were by the flesh pots and everything was taken care of for them. Doesn't that kind of seem like what's going on right now in our, in our, in our society? Man, nobody even wants to go back to work, man. They're giving them free money, supposedly, man. They got food stamps. They got, you know what, uh, what else do they call that stuff where they pay your rent and all that stuff? That said, that, that's what I'm talking about. All those things that they get, and guess what? They don't want to get up and they don't want to do nothing. Why? They're by the flesh pots. And why? Because when they get out, they start complaining. Oh, this is too hard. No, we're 
are just lazy. I mean, those things that manifest themselves in the flesh will manifest themselves in the spirit. So if you're lazy in the flesh, guess what? You're lazy in the spirit. It's plain and simple. The things that you do in the flesh, let me say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we're all thinking about what comes out of our mouth all the time. Oh, he's, he's so angry and he's so this. And that's not what that scripture is talking about. It's talking about out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth. It's talking about the way that you operate, the things that you do, what your flesh does. You know, I don't have to speak for you to know that I'm mad. I just go like this. <laughs> you know, I'm mad. Out of the abundance of my heart, I'm mad. And when I'm happy, I'm happy. Huh? When I'm in between, it's like this. I'm in between. <laughs> it's there. It's the way that we handle ourselves. It's not necessarily what you speak. It's how you operate and how you handle yourself. You don't have to say nothing. How many know that they always tell us, they always told us that in, the, in, the, in school and all that, that your actions speak louder than words. It's about how you act and how you operate. How you ha That's how these people were. I like what it says. And kill the whole assembly with hunger. Man, I'm not trying to kill you. I'm trying to kill off the flesh. Really, I am. But I'm not trying to kill your spirit. I'm trying to allow your spiritual man to grow. But how many you know when it comes to the flesh and the spirit, man, because we're not spending time with Jesus. We're not praying. We're not talking to him. We're not having that personal time with him. That the flesh is dominating everything in our lives. I cannot force you to pray. I cannot force you to come to church. I can't force you to do anything. All I can do is share with you and, and encourage you and tell you, come on, you can do it. You're better than that. Come on, get plugged in. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And then me telling you guys, let's go. It's like I'm Moses and I'm Aaron. Oh, I'd rather he, he's taking me from the flesh pot in Egypt. And then you guys begin to get mad at me and you hate me. Instead of looking in the mirror and saying, oh, man, I got to submit. It's not even Pastor Leon. It's not even him. You know what, man? It, it, it's the Lord trying to deal with me. He wants to deal with this flesh. And he wants me to submit. And he wants to produce fruits in my life. He's tired of me complaining. He's tired of me grumbling. He's tired of all that stuff. He wants me to see where he brought me from. I mean, some people, they always think the grass is greener on the other side. That's like with my company. Everybody always thinks the grass is greener on the other side. I just laugh at them all the time. I'm going to go to this other job down the street. They're going to give me a company truck, and they're going to give me a raise, and, and you know what, and everything's going to be better over there. A month later, they're over here back. Can I have my job back? I thought the grass was greener on the other side. You have to put up with more crap over there. That's what happened. Now that's, that's what's over there. That's why it's so green. That's why it's so green. You know, it takes more manure to make that grass greener over there. There's a lot of crap over there. You got to put up with a lot of crap. That's why you over there. And then you always want to come back. Oh, I'm going to come back. Can I come back, please? Come on back. Come on back over here. And we always take them back instead of telling them no. You know what? That's the Lord. Even though you want to go over there and experience the greener side, you know what? We all come coming back. I'm sorry, God. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Huh? Come on now, church. Ihole. Romans chapter 5. We're getting ready to close here real quick. Verses 20 through 21. How many of you love the Lord here today? Amen. amen, amen. I know I'm not like all those other pastors you guys have used to hearing preach. I'm not like the Charles Spurgeons and the Jimmy Swaggerts and all those guys. 
It says, but then the law came in only to expand and increase the trespasses, making it more apparent and exciting, an exciting opposition. But, hold on, but where sin increased and abounded, let's go on, grace, God's unmerited favor has surpassed it and increased the more and superabounded. Do you guys understand that? You know, I see so many of these Christians, they come in, you know what, they've never been through nothing. I've never been addicted to this, or I've never done that, or I've never done that. I was a goody two-shoe when I came to the Lord. I was perfect. Huh? And they don't understand, you know, and that's like how my family is, not like my, my, my wife's side of the family. They think that we need church because I'm just such a bad person. Oh, you need church because, yeah, you need it because, yeah, you're messed up. You need church. <laughs> oh, you need Jesus all the time because, man, yeah, you're, you're messed up. How I many you know that's why when we come to serve the Lord, the Lord, he's not a respecter of person or of character or where you've been through, the things that you hadn't been through, but he wants to take you to the, the, the thing of sin. He wants to have you, comfort, you know, right there up, up in front, you know, looking at things in your life. To begin to see that you're a sinful person, no matter if you haven't been on that side of the tracks. How many of you guys remember the movie, The Outsiders? He used to teach it in school, Pony Boy and all those guys, remember? They had the greasers on one side and then the, the socias on the other ones. Basically, when we were growing up, we called them the jocks. Those are the jocks and we're the other guys over here. And we were always beating up the jocks all the time. They are always all mad. Oh, those guys over there. They're dirty. They're nasty. <laughs> but God wants to take us to that place of sin. He wants to take us into the wilderness. So that way we can see how sinful we are. That's why the wilderness is so important in our lives. And that's why he takes us there to the wilderness. That's why he takes us there. So that way we can begin to, you know what, love his grace. And understand that grace, God's unmerited favor, has surpassed it and increased the more and more. And it super abounds. You know what? That we don't take his grace, you know what, for, for granted. We begin to enjoy it and be so thankful for it. Man, thank you for your grace, Lord God. Thank you for your mercy, Lord God. Not, oh, he needs it more than I do. We all need it. That's why we got to be in the wilderness, church. Why? So that way we can, you know what, depend upon God's grace. Let's go on. He says, so that just as sin has reigned in death, so grace has its unearned and undeserved favor, might reign also through righteousness, its right standing with God, which issues in eternal life through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, our Lord. Amen. You know, without the wilderness, you can't love Jesus the way that you should love him. You can go to church all you want to. You can read the Word of God all you want to. But if you're not willing to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you into the wilderness, you can't love God the way that you need to love Him with everything that you are. That's why the wilderness is so important. Why? Because it removes all of ourselves. It removes everything that we are so that way we can put all our trust in Him and who He is and what He did on the cross of Calvary. He did it. He paid the price. He did it. It's his joy. It's his unmerited favor. It's his works. It's all about him. It's nothing about me. I'm removed out of the way. It's all about Jesus. That's why the wilderness is so important. Because it removes the flesh out of the way. It removes us out of the way, church. Two more verses. Proverbs 18:15. And then we're going to come to this altar this morning. Amen. The mind of the prudent is ever getting knowledge, and the ear of the wise is ever seeking and inquiring for the craving knowledge. This is us here, at church. The mind of the prudent is ever getting knowledge, and the ear of the wise is ever seeking. It's inquiring for and craving knowledge. 
How many of you guys are constantly seeking change in your life? A godly change, though. A godly change. You know, I used to be like, I could pray for a minute. How many of us were the minute prayers? Come on, like the Uncle Ben's rice box, the minute prayers. You got to have it in an instant, right? We started off praying for our meals. Rub a dub dub, thank you for the grub, right? And then it began, started getting more intense. Ah, Lord, thank you that you're the provider, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, that when I walk into the store, Lord God, that you know what, that everything's right there for me already. I don't have to go pull it off a tree and go into the fields because everybody else did it for me. Ah, you don't even think about that. Uh. I need to start growing you a greenhouse inside the backyard. Man, my neighbor just brought me over some, some tomatoes yesterday. They didn't stand a chance. I ate the whole bag. <laughs> it's like that. Ate them all. They're gone. Kids were looking at me like I was going to share. I like, I ain't sharing. These are mine. <laughs> Get your own. These are my tomatoes. But ever increasing. How many of us are just happy with the little bit that we've learned from, you know what, in, in the past? That we don't go any farther than that. You know, we're happy with just hearing a sermon, you know what, on YouTube or on Sunday every once in a while, but we don't open up the Word of God for ourselves when we go home. You know, we rely upon the pastor to pray for us at the church. You know what, we're, we're, we're in church and we're just waiting for the altar call and we go up there. Pastor, ayúdame, por favor. Can you please pray for me, please? Pastor, please, I need you to pray for me. Pa qué? Why? Don't you know how to pray for yourself? There's nothing that I can do for you that you can't do for yourself. See, and that's something that I want to teach you guys here. You know what? I'm not a god. I ain't anything like that. I'm just an average person like all the rest of you in here. Am I the pastor of the church? Yes. But the thing is, is you know what? You got to learn to do things for yourself. How I many know that you can pray for yourself? You waited all week, man. You went through all those problems all week with your spouse and with your children. You waited all week. I got to go tell pastor. No, you don't. You got to go tell Jesus. That's who you got to go tell. Man, why are you waiting to tell me everything? No, no, you know, I'll pray for you. I will. I'll anoint you, lay hands on you. I'll do all that stuff. I'm not saying that I won't. I will. But you can do the same thing. You know what? And it's more personal, and it means more when you do it yourself. Why? Because Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. Yeah. And he wants you to grow right there. He wants you to, you know what, to get knowledge. How many of us are getting knowledge? Not worldly, not man. We, man, we think we're smart, don't we? Man, you know how, how really ignorant a lot of us are right now? Man, we don't have to do anything. You want to learn how to do something, you go to YouTube. How do you put up a brick wall? Putting up a brick wall. You go to YouTube and you watch all the videos and all of a sudden you're a bricklayer. And then a month later, the bricks are falling off of the wall. <laughs> Anybody can do it, you know what I mean? But do you know the ins and outs? Do you know the temperatures? Do you know, you know what things to do and things not to do? You know, a lot of us, we don't know that. Right away, we just go to YouTube and we think we know how to do everything. We go to, you know, we go to Google, our favorite, favorite source now. It isn't Webster's Dictionary anymore. What does Webster have to say? We go to Google all the time. How many know Google is biased? Google's by, there's so many different search engines out there, and I encourage you to use other search engines besides Google, because Google is biased. You get on Google right away, everybody's doctors all, all of a sudden, oh, I got a runny nose. First, oh, you got COVID. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got a runny nose. How many know that COVID is worse than drugs? Híjole, you don't really, COVID stays in your system longer than marijuana does. You could have had COVID and you can go get tested six months later down the road and just have a runny nose and all of a sudden you have COVID. When you don't even have COVID, you have a runny nose. Whatever happened to all the other illnesses that are out there, church? Like diarrhea. <laughs> It ain't diarrhea no more. It's COVID. 
Everything's COVID. Hey, man, we need to get on this church. You know what, man? We can't be fearful. We can't live in fear. You know what? Is it a real thing that's out there? Yes, it is. But I don't know about everybody else. There's a thing that's called soap. Hand sanitizer. Wash your hands. Put some hand sanitizer on. You know, when you cough, cough in your arm. Simple little things that we can do instead of wearing masks and going like this, like if somebody's Count Dracula. <laughs> Pretty soon you're going to be like my grandma. God bless her. Man, I thought that uh, garlic was the cure for everything. <laughs> garlic clothes over here hanging, garlic lotion, and garlic does everything. <laughs> Eat onions, full onion. It's good for high blood pressure, everything. <laughs> Like, oh, man, I'm chill with all that stuff. I'm just a typical Mexican. That's all I am. Mine is menudo. Menudo's the cure-all for everything. <laughs> menudo does it all for me. Amen? But see, we got to start living in the Word of God, church. We got to get knowledge. Knowledge in the Word. How many know that the Bible says that every man's days are numbered here on earth? So whether you get this or whether you get that, whether you get cancer, whatever you get, guess what? Your days are numbered here on this earth. You have a set amount of time for you to be here on this earth, whether you and I like it or not. Our kids have a set amount of time to be here on this earth, so you better start enjoying all the time that you have and being thankful for it. Amen? Amen. I'm going to close with this. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. How many of you know that we got to go through some hard things? I've been telling you about going through the wilderness. How many of you guys are ready to go through the wilderness? Crickets. I don't want to go through the wilderness. I don't like it. I like everything to be great, Pastor. I like everything to be in order and all nice and, and you know, just the way that I like it. Crash course in life, that's not life, church. Life is tough. You know what? Someday you got to move from mama's house sometime, and you got to pay your own bills. And you're like, mom, can I move back? And she's like, no, I got rid of you. Stay out there. <laughs> well, can I borrow some money then? <laughs> no, you can't borrow money. <laughs> Now yeah, we give them money. Here you go. How I many you know that when, when our kids get older, we become their piggy bank? We're like their, their bank account. I swear, right away, can I borrow some money, Mom? Can I borrow some money, Dad? No. Okay, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to see you suffer. <laughs> God forbid you can't buy some Taco Bell. Hijole. <laughs> <laughs> The mind of the prudent is ever getting knowledge. Did you go? You didn't change. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Yes. Chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. Amen. I thought we already read that one. He's trying to trick me. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to trick me. He almost got me. Are there ministering servants of Christ, the Messiah? With a question mark right there. The Apostle Paul is being sarcastic right here. How many know he's talking about all the Joel Osteens and all these other... Oh, no, okay, sorry, forgive me, Lord. I shouldn't have mentioned names. He's talking about all these candy-coated preachers out there right now. They were even back there in his time. And he was saying right here, he says, Are there ministering servants of Christ, the Messiah? With a question mark? Or What? Are people going to preach Christ? You know what? Him crucified, us taking up our cross, you know what? And following him, that it's a sacrifice, that it's going to be hard, it ain't going to be easy. Are there real Christians out there that are going to preach like this or what? And then he goes on to say, I'm talking like one beside himself. Yeah, right away there's that sarc sarcasticness. He's talking like one beside himself. But I am more with far more extensive and abundant labors. Man, the Apostle Paul was no joke. 
He was on ships traveling to different places in storms, man. He was walking in his sandals, sometimes with no sandals, on hot dirt and rocks, you know what, and, and stickers and all kinds of stuff, getting bit by all kinds of bugs. And, man, it was hard for him. But he went all over whenever. He didn't even care. He just did it. I can't even get half of the church to come to street ministry. Forget street ministry. I can't even get half of the church to come to prayer night. But I like what he says here. He says, extensive and abundant in labors. Now, that means he went above and beyond. The Apostle Paul wasn't doing what the Apostle Paul wanted to do, what Saul would have did. He was doing what the born again Apostle Paul needed to do for the Lord. Let's go on. He says, with far more imprisonment. How many of you guys would go to jail for the gospel? I knew so many pastors that used to tell me. I used to watch them on TV. I used to go to their churches and everything. And they'd be like, oh, I'll go to jail for the Lord. And then COVID hit, and right away they closed their doors. <laughs> we didn't. I told the church, I said, just put aside some bail money for me, please. Just bail me out. But I'll go to jail. I will. I'll keep these doors open. I'll go to jail. That ain't no problem. You know, I, it's a vacation I used to share with you guys. Hey, jole, get me on vacation. Send me there for 30 days for six. Hey, jole. Yeah. I'll be sleeping all day long. What's up? Breakfast? I'm going to get some breakfast. Mm, cool. Going back. Going to sleep. Hey, come back out refreshed. <laughs> Let's get back with this ministry thing. What's going on? Huh? Hallelujah. How's the Apostle Paul? Says that he was beaten with countless stripes and frequently at the point of death. This isn't the American Christian. This isn't any Christian that I know about, to be honest with you, who will face imprisonment and beatings, you know what, and almost death to preach Christ. You know, it's kind of like um, the, the switch and, 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 the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the and the blade. Nicky Cruz. Nicky Cruz, he went over there to, to the gang-infested lands of New York. He'd walk in there and talk to all the gangbangers. You know, Jesus, I'll stab you right now. He's like, I'll talk about Jesus anyways. <laughs> Half of us, I can't even get you guys out of, the, out of bed. This is the Apostle Paul. You know what? He was ready to go to the extreme. You know, wherever it go. You know, we go. We, I used to take the church out to Denver. I remember their cross course. I'd take them to Denver. Remember, sister? What are we, we're going to go feed the homeless. I'd be like, oh, my God. Where is he taking us to? <laughs> ah, look at every. Oh, my God. All, Do we have to get out of the van? <laughs> get out of the van. <laughs> Will you go with me? No, go by yourself. <laughs> And they loved it, but it was a crash course taking them into those places, the highways and the byways, you know what, to where those things that you ain't comfortable in. But that's what the Apostle Paul was talking to us about here. Church, you know what, it's outside of these walls. You know, we get taught inside of here the things that we're supposed to do, and we take it out there. But how many of us, you know what, we don't get taught that in, in churches these days. You got to go to a real church to get taught these things. This is a real church, Holy Ghost-filled church. Let's go on. He said, five times I received from the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes, all but one, the religious folk. Those are all the, the mega, all those big, all of, you know, I'm not, I'm not making fun of mega churches, church. I want you to know that because there's a lot of good mega churches out there. But there's a lot of bad ones too. There's a lot of ones that don't preach the Word of God like they should be preaching the Word of God. Man, they have millions of people that come through them doors. Imagine the impact that they could have on people's lives if they would start telling them the truth instead of wanting to take up a collection. Hmm? And even if it was just one time, you know what? You just got to give them the Word one time and they'll be changed forever, just that one time. But he did this. You know what? He got beaten. Let's go on. Three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I've been ab abroad a shipwreck at sea. A whole night and a day I have spent adrift on the deep. 
many times on journeys exposed to perils from rivers, perils from bandits, perils from my own nation, perils from the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in desert places, perils in the sea, perils from those posing as believers, but destitute of Christian knowledge and piety. All these so-called professing Christians, you know what? He, he went everywhere and anywhere around so much people that profess to be Christians and this and that, but yet they didn't have it. Why? Because they weren't willing to tell people the truth like he was. How many of you are willing to go for the sacrifice and tell people the truth? You know what? I'm a Christian. I'm a real Christian. Amen. I ain't one of them fake ones that you can see everywhere. I'm a real Christian. Well, why do you talk like that? Because I'm for real. That's why. You know, I always have to, always people tell me that all the time. You know what I mean? Well, why do you talk like that? I was like, because I ain't trying to be somebody that I ain't. That's why. I'm real. I am who I am in Christ Jesus. And I don't got to pretend to talk like this and pretend to act like that. I'm going to act the way I'm going to act, and I'm going to talk the way that I talk because I'm real. Yeah. That's why. Let's go on. In toil and hardships, watching often through sleepless nights. Look at the Lord wakes you up at night, and instead of going to the refrigerator, you should be going to prayer. Oh, but man, those Cheerios sound good. <laughs> In hunger and thirst, it says, frequently driven to fasting by want. Man, I can't even say we're having, we're going to be fasting this week and not able to complain and murmur, oh my God, how am I going to do it? Oh, I'm getting all my shakes ready and have you ever heard of the Daniel fast? Stop all that. You know, he wanted to fast. Why? Because of all the things that were going on and all the things that were happening. It drove him to fast. His spirit desired to fast. How many of you are fasting for your family, fasting for your children, fasting for the church, fasting for the ministry, fasting? Why? Because you're, you're, you're driven to it. Not because somebody tells you to. He says, in cold and exposure and lack of clothing, last verse, and besides those things that are without, there is the daily inexpressible pressure, inescapable pressure of my care and anxiety for all the churches. I want you not to look at these walls here, church, and I want you to look at everybody that's around you. Because we are the church. The Bible, the Bible tells us in its, you know, in, in, in its form in Hebrew, in its meaning, it's called ecclesia. And the ecclesia is a body of believers. It's not a church building. It's not where you go attend on Sunday. It's a body of believers. And this is the Apostle Paul here. He says, an inescapable pressure. He couldn't run from it. He couldn't hide from it. It was just there constantly because of the love he had for God. He had this love for God, and he had the love for God's people. And he says, of my care and my anxiety for what? For all the churches. For you and I. Church, I want you to know something here today. I want you to know that I love you so much. And it's so hard for me to come up here day after day and year after year to preach the way that I do because everything inside of me doesn't want to offend you. Everything inside of me doesn't want to hurt your feelings. Everything inside of me wants to lift you up and do that. That's the flesh. But the spirit that lives in me feels like this. I can't escape it. I can't run from it. And all I can do is break before the Lord and be honest about everything that I preach from behind this pulpit and love you in a, such a way that the Lord loves you, that he gave everything. He was willing to lose it all, to gain it all. You don't belong to me. 
You belong to him. And I embrace you all here this morning. And I want you to know that I truly do love you. And I am truly grateful for each and every single one of you. And I care about your soul. I care about where you're going to go. I care about where your family's going to go. I care about the fruits that you are going to bear and grow in your life. I care about those things. That's why I preach the way that I do. And that's why I share the things that I do. Because you guys mean more to me than an offering and a plate. You're my family. And you know what? And I know that we're going to be up there when it happens. I'm going to be like, man, you made it. <laughs> you made it, brother. You made it. You made it. You made it. We made it. We made it. Hallelujah. We made it. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to be looking down like that and be like, man, they could have made it. They should have made it. But we made it. Amen. But we made it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Give him praise this morning. We're going to come up to this altar this morning and we're going to pray. Amen. We're going to talk to Jesus. I don't know what you're going through in your life. You know what you're going through and you know what you need to talk to the Lord about this morning. Amen. And I want you just to spend some time with him this morning before we leave this service. I want you to talk to him. I want you to tell him, you know what, Lord, I need you to meet my every need this week. I need you to help me to be an example wherever you send me this week, whatever I'm doing this week, that people would see you and not me. I want to produce those fruits, Lord God. I want to be a, a fruit bearer, you know what, that everybody will be able to, you know what, share with that, with that fruit. Amen. God bless you this morning, church.
of my heart Here I am, here you are I let out the sounds of my heart Here I am, here you are